Hi everybody, thanks so much for watching. I'm Nicole Herzog and this is Chicago This Week. We begin with a series of reports on Chicago's public transportation. King Jemison will tell us why many commuters and lawmakers are frustrated by problems with the Chicago Transit Authority. That's despite recent expansions. First, Haley Samples takes us to the city's newest stop. It took three years to build, but it's now up and running. Haley, it wasn't easy to get to this point, was it? That's right, Nicole. Despite financial obstacles that slowed down the completion of this stop, a Metro spokesperson told me they're happy to finally open it up to the community. Look out CTA because there's a new Metro station in town. Finally, it's open. We're overjoyed. <laughs> After nearly three years of construction, Metro unveiled their new stop at the intersection of Peterson and Ridge. The grand opening attracted both riders and curious Chicago locals. One even traveled from Evanston to see it in person. This is a really great new station, uh, for, especially for the local residents here. Although the station is up and running smoothly, a Metro spokesperson said they ran into a few roadblocks during construction. It kind of got caught up in some funding issues uh, last decade. Um, we we were severely scrapped, uh, scrimped for, for capital dollars um, for many years. This new station adds trains that will fill gaps during rush hour and reduce crowding on the trains. I think I've been at Metro for 15 years, and this is only the third one that I can recall us opening. So as I say, this was a long time coming, and we're very happy to finally get it open. And while today was the first day of service here at the Peterson Ridge Station, officials say there will be a ribbon cutting ceremony later next month. From Edgewater, Haley Samples, Chicago This Week. Thanks, Haley. It's true. CTA riders sometimes encounter delays, mechanical issues, crime, and other disruptions. Now some lawmakers are demanding a change in leadership. Let's go to King Jemison with that part of the story. Hi, King. Hi, Nicole. So many Chicagoans come down these very steps from the State and Lake CTA station every day as part of their commute. But since the pandemic, that commute has been more difficult with service cuts and safety issues. Now, some Chicago City Council members are looking to hold the CTA president accountable for these problems. Service is down and crime is up on CTA compared to pre-pandemic levels. Some Chicago City Council members have had enough. This has been a long time coming to um, hold our President Dorval Carter accountable for the things that he has been talking about for a while now. Mana Hoppenworth is one of over 20 older people who have signed a resolution to remove CTA President Dorval Carter. The resolution claims CTA rail services have been cut by 22% since 2019. It also says that the agency is facing major staffing deficits and safety challenges. It's been the number one thing that my constituents have been talking about since the campaign trail. Everybody talks about the soul of Chicago, but really you need to talk about the heartbeat too, and I think that transit is that. And we're just not seeing that change right now happen. Frequent CTA riders agree that the agency needs to improve its safety and service. I feel like there needs to be better communication, better directions, more safety. There's a lot of safety issues. That's why they should have like security guards around. You'll show up and there'll be delays and stuff like that. You just have to rely on something that is not reliable. Some of the riders called for shakeups at the CTA. The old leader not doing what he's supposed to do, and his time is up. I think it's time for some change. The resolution to remove Carter is expected to be introduced at this week's city council meeting. For Chicago This Week, I'm King Jemison. Thanks, King. Now let's turn to a very disturbing trend uncovered by local journalists. Anaya Jones joins me in the studio with this report. Anaya, domestic violence calls are up dramatically, and we know about one factor that might be contributing, right? Yes, Nicole. For domestic violence victims and also people who are being physically abused, sometimes their only option is to go to a free shelter. And that's because they may not have relatives that live nearby or, I mean, we know that hotels cost money. So, the Chicago Sun-Times found that when many people would call shelters, they were turned away because there were no beds. That's when those cases turned into 911 calls. Frustration. Frustration that all of a sudden this is a surprise. 
This was Denise Urban's first reaction when she saw the recent report by anti-domestic violence advocates. The report stated that the Illinois domestic hotline saw a 90 percent increase in calls, text and messages in 2023 compared to pre-pandemic levels. So once lockdowns ended and people had more ability to leave, um, we saw calls surge because people could finally escape the situation that they were in. As domestic violence victims were looking for shelter, many face constant rejection. At every turn, it's, you know, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We don't have a bed or this doesn't, you know, you don't meet the eligibility criteria. All because there weren't enough shelter beds. According to this report, there were no beds or cribs available for 124 days in Chicago in 2023. That means for those 124 days, people's lives were literally at risk. This is due to a lack of funding and resources. According to Rebecca Dar, CEO of Wings, the largest domestic violence service provider in Illinois, there's a common misconception that shelters are paid for and operated by the government. When we built this shelter in 2016, it cost over $10 million. The city put up about 1.2 and we got about 2 million from the state. The rest of that was private funding. Hence, why donations from the Chicago Bears, Art Van Furniture, and many others are vital to get shelters up and running. These organizations are helping break the cycle of domestic violence, and so can you with a tax-deductible gift to local domestic violence shelters and educating your loved ones about this issue. In Chicago Lawn, Anaya Jones, Chicago This Week. Thanks, Anaya. Now on to education. The Illinois House is considering a plan that would help student teachers with expenses. Blanca Estrada tells us how, if the proposal passes, rather than have student teachers help out in a classroom for free, they'd get some money for their work. Hi, Blanca. Hi, Nicole. The teacher shortage has been a significant issue in the country, including Illinois. With the teacher stipend, government officials hope more students will join this field and help them along the way. This past week, a bill was introduced in the Illinois House that provides student teachers with stipends. Known as House Bill 4652, the bill amends the Board of Education Act and it requires the Board of Education to create a student teaching stipend program to elevate the financial burden of student teaching and to encourage students to pursue teaching careers, especially since this career requires a lot. In this scenario is really uncomfortable. It's high stress. There's a lot that's put on your plate. The bill will provide $10,000 to student teachers working in public high schools, such as this one behind me. Introduced by State Representative Barbara Hernandez and an initiative by the Illinois Education Association, the bill will cost an estimate $68 million. In an email interview with Barbara, she said, Offering students a stipend while they earn teaching degrees is big step towards addressing Illinois teacher shortage, which has been a significant issue for a long time. During your student teaching, you are going to be so busy and you're gonna get overwhelmed very easily. A lot of students believe that this stipend will be tremendous help, such as freshman Megan Soto. I mean, encourage me to finish getting my degree and also uh, encourage other students pursuing education to finish their degree. However, some student teachers remain unsure, especially since the money needed hasn't been included in next year's budget. The bill now goes to the Senate for further consideration. In the suburbs, Blanca Estrada, Chicago This Week. Thanks, Blanca. The American Writers Festival was recently held right here in Chicago. Thousands of writers, readers, collectors, and more gathered to celebrate books. Our Kennedy Hewitt attended the event. She joins us now with more. Hi, Kennedy. Hi, Nicole. Writers all around Chicago came together not only to give readers more information about the stories they've written, but also the stories that they've lived. Take a look. Book lovers all over Chicago gathered for the second time in two years to celebrate the American Writers Festival, spanning nine floors of panel discussions to tabling sessions. This free event bridges the gap between readers and their favorite authors. There's a bunch of folks that are from all over the Chicagoland area, and those are the folks that we're trying to, to 
um, to reach. It's a great opportunity for organizations to connect with people who like to read and who are supporters of reading and writing. A day of writers telling the story behind the story. Kept going through it and next thing I know I've got a 400 plus page compendium. James Asriel is not only an author, but a horror movie prop collector. Stemming from a childhood passion, he spent decades collecting tokens and trinkets from our favorite movies. I'm the coolest 12 year old at the Scholastic Book Fair, you know, like little me is jumping up and down. A 2000 piece collection that he now holds the Guinness World Record for. Like many other authors at the festival, this was a passion project that turned into something much larger something that fostered community. My mission statement, if you will, is to bring these items out from behind the closed doors so the fans can see them up close. We have exhibits in our museum that celebrate the writers of the past. We do programming all the time that promotes authors of the present. With the hope for one thing. The real hope is that we inspire the writers of tomorrow. In The Loop, Kennedy Hewitt, Chicago This Week. Thanks, Kennedy. Summer is right around the corner. And with it comes concerts, festivals, and outdoor celebrations. One such celebration is Mexican Independence Day. Without a formal location for people to congregate, that day has gotten out of hand in the past. But not anymore. Take a look. This is insane. It's a tradition that the city's Latino leaders say should have never had to happen. They're doing it because there's nowhere to celebrate. Caravans and rowdy crowds have been known to flood the streets downtown during Mexican Independence Day in the last few years. But this year, city leaders are hoping that will change. After 10 years without a city-sanctioned celebration downtown, a Mexican Independence Day event called Grito Fest will take over Grant Park for two days on September 14th, and 15th. It'll be complete with traditional Mexican food, music, and dancing. And, you know, we're one of the fastest growing populations in the city of Chicago. We're already a very large population that has been a part of the heart of the city uh, since, the, we're the, since the World's Fair. And you know, to, to be able to have a celebration for us, uh, it would be important. Because of safety concerns, festivities have been capped here in Little Village for years. But that didn't stop people from getting in their cars and celebrating downtown. But with the now official celebration here in Grant Park, people will get to do both. With at least 11 felonies, despite street closures during last year's Mexican Independence Day, some are expressing concerns for safety. But Jose Munoz with the Illinois Latino Agenda says Grito Fest shouldn't be any different from other large gatherings like St. Patrick's Day. We have thousands and thousands of people that come into the city of Chicago and the city is able to execute on an event like that with very few issues. And we anticipate that the same thing could happen if we put in the same type of support and resources. Little Village Community Council Director Bal Baltazar Enriquez says he has fond memories of attending the city sanctioned event as a child before it was canceled. He hopes to instill that sense of pride in his family. We're part of this community, um, well, not only part of this community, but a part of the city of Chicago, and we have built this, this city too. Hyde Park residents will be in for a disappointing surprise. If they were hoping to stick to tradition and attend an annual music festival, several neighborhood summer concerts will no longer be happening. Jasmine Thomas joins us now. So why the cancellations, Jasmine? Nicole, the answer is money. Hyde Park festivals have been put to rest due to rising event costs. If you plan to go to these two festivals this summer, you might want to make some changes to your calendar. The Hyde Park community has been hit with heart-wrenching news twice in one year. Music festivals considered staples in their community will not be returning for summer 2024. The Silver Room Block Party had their last ride last summer and the Hyde Park Music Festival announced their indefinite cancellation this past week. As summer approaches, residents have reflected on how festivals have impacted their community. It created a safe space for beautiful black and brown bodies and people of all different walks of life to like congregate and just like enjoy and indulge in like the finer things in life. It's a historical Hyde Park event, you know, something that they used to have like every year. Like something I'm looking forward to, like it like kicks off my summer. It just brought people together. It was a time that we congregated and loved on one another. And so yeah, so it's definitely gonna be missed. Both festivals started as small free events and blossomed into something highly anticipated in the city. As event planning prices increased, it became too costly to continue. As we close this chapter, the community has an opportunity to open a new one. 
Residents say this is the time for growth for the community to take action and be active with one another of like, OK, what can we do now? There is now plenty of room for new events in Hyde Park, and the Silver Room is dedicated to keeping culture alive in the city. Follow them on Instagram to stay up to date on events this summer. From Hyde Park, I'm Jasmine Thomas, Chicago This Week. Hello, sports fans. It's time for Chicago This Week Sports. I'm Sean Graney. Some of the best young basketball players out there gathered in Chicago this past week. The NBA Draft Combine showcased the future stars of the game. I had the chance to talk to the prospects and watch them play. Being able to come, at, come to the Combine and shoot as well or, or do anything I can to make myself a better projection, uh, that's what I'm going to do. A new era of the NBA is starting to take shape and all eyes are on the future stars of the association with the first step beginning at the NBA Draft Combine. I mean, you know, I'm a competitor, so I want to be first in everything I do. I don't know if it's that important because I can't control it, but of course it, it means something. Yeah, this class is, I think, really good. I mean, we got tons of great players, so I think anybody could go anywhere, to be honest. Each top prospect has a different story, play style, and mentality that has gotten them here. And players say the key will be to amplify those qualities heading into the draft next month. Just don't change anything about me, you know, just, just stay the person I am, stay the player I am, and you know, just, keep, just keep trying to get better. I just embrace it. Uh, the coach told us to embrace it. Um, it's going to come no matter what, so just embrace it. In front of the watchful eyes of NBA executives, players are hoping to showcase that they are not only just amazing players on the court, but also extraordinary individuals and leaders off the court. Right, most people that come up to me don't know I play basketball, played in college, or even play a sport besides obviously my height. So I guess them just knowing that I'm a regular person. In the end, players say they are simply grateful for the opportunity to realize an NBA dream and are taking the process one step at a time. Um, I want to be an elite level defender. I'm going to make it happen no matter what. That's my main focus. That's going to happen. You know, really the only thing that I need to add when I go to the NBA, you know, it's just being able to knock down that three ball. But I don't really compare myself to uh, anyone in the league. You know, uh, I think everybody plays a different type of role. The NBA draft is set for June 26th and 27th at Barclays Center in New York. And the Atlanta Hawks are slated to pick first overall for the first time ever in the draft lottery era. The Chicago Sky have kicked off their official season. Their first opponents were the Dallas Wings. For more, let's hear from Mary Grace Grable. Hi, Mary Grace. Hi, Sean, you are right. The Sky had a tough start to their season, although they made up for it by winning their game on Saturday, 83-74. to It was a desire to win. We're hungry to, to get it done. Marina Mabry buries the three. We bettered ourselves in the second half of things that we wanted to accomplish and how we wanted to play. Coach Weatherspoon celebrated her first regular season WNBA win with the Chicago Sky alongside rookie Angel Reese. Even though I'm young, I know I bring a lot of energy to this team. I know my energy is contagious and I just try to boost everybody up as much as I can. This week has been memorable for Reese, who also made her starting five debut on Wednesday. My vets have put a lot of confidence in me. My coaching staff has put a lot of confidence confidence in me. They really don't treat me like a rookie, and they always just are there for me. They help me with plays, defensive assignments, and just being there. Reese knocks over Segris off the glass. Aggressive move. Reese is not only focused on her personal growth, but growing the sport of women's basketball. They're not just coming to see me. They're coming to see all of us. Being able to grow women's basketball is long overdue. Let's move on to football now. With all the new recruits in place, Chicago Bears fans can't wait to get the new season started. Now we know who they'll be playing and when. Karina Wilson is in the studio. Hey Karina, so what can you tell us? Sean, the Bears look to improve to a winning record this upcoming season. The team has three primetime games and a holiday game. Well, we knew the teams, uh, we knew the towns, and now we know the times and dates. The Chicago Bears released their 2024 regular season schedule ahead of the squad's 105th season. Oh, freshman year, here we go. Caleb Williams and Rome Odunze look to be the Bears' saving grace. 
the feeling is, is you know, they want to win um, and they're excited about winning um, and getting the right people here um, for the culture is really important. Chicago selected Williams first overall in the 2024 NFL Draft from the University of Southern California. The rookie has already earned the title QB1. With the first pick in the 2024 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Caleb Williams. This season marks Matt Eberflus' third season with the Monsters of the Midway. Chicago finished its 2023 season 7 and 10, but things look different this year. Most notably, the absence of quarterback Justin Fields. Be a great leader, you got to learn how to follow first. So right now, I'm following all the vets, I'm following all the coaches, um, I'm listening. Um, you know, having having both ears open and, and, and my mouth shut. The Bears kick off their season at Soldier Field versus the Tennessee Titans on September 8th. The season moves fast. If you don't slow down once in a while, you'll miss it. In the Loop, Karina Wilson, Chicago This Week. After an incredible season so far, the Northwestern women's lacrosse team will go down in the history books. As Casey clark Malott shows us, that's thanks to one very special player. Hi, Casey. Hi, Sean. Izzy Skane's name is now at the top of NCAA record books, and she has helped pave the way for the Wildcats to have the second highest scoring offense in the country. In the near side, the roll. The shot, the goal, the record, the best in NCAA history, Izzy Skane. Early in the first quarter against Denver on May 12th, Izzy Skane made history. It's crazy. I think um, we all kind of start out the same way, like little kids with a dream to play in college and play at the highest level. And it's just a testament to Northwestern as a, a program and as a dynasty. And I'm, I'm lucky to be able to uh, be the person to kind of put that up front. Scoring goal number 359 and becoming the all-time leading scorer of Division I women's lacrosse. It's kind of surreal, I guess, would be the best way to put it. It's kind of amazing to, to, to think back. But at the moment, I tell you, it was uh, almost just relief more than anything at the time. <laughs> Izzy attributed much of her success to those of her past. And I think I've just been super, super lucky with the teams and the coaches I've been blessed with my entire life, not just at Northwestern, but before then. One coach from before is Greg Corder, her high school coach. Corder remembers the 2017 Michigan State Championship. She was lying on the ground, completely exhausted. Gave her a low five, I guess, and said, we did it. Um, and I said, we, because without her approach, I'm not sure we would have won that championship. She set the tone every day in practice. After another win against Penn on May 16th, Skane and the Wildcats are heading to the NCAA Final Four, looking for a back-to-back -back national title. If this team can repeat again, it really would go up there as one of the best teams, you know, in the sport and history and all that stuff. And Skane sits with 367 goals currently as Northwestern plays Florida on May 24th at 2 p.m. Central with a spot in the national title game on the line. Reporting from Evanston, I'm Casey clark Mallott, Chicago This Week. A local high school boy watched his friend lose his father to a deadly disease. To remember that dad and others like him, he decided to use his sport to raise awareness and money. Caleb Nixon joins us now with this story. Hi, Caleb. Hi, Sean. Summer is nearly here, meaning high school sports are coming to an end. With the IHSA playoffs currently underway for boys volleyball, one libero is hoping to record as many digs as possible in the final stretch of the season. A dig is off of an attack from the other team is when someone plays the ball and it's a playable second ball. This season, Frawley's digs mean just a bit more. Every dig I get, I'm donating $1 to my cancer fundraiser that I partnered with in the American Cancer Society. He started the fundraiser because of those he's lost to the disease specifically after a close friend lost his father to brain cancer in January. And I just thought that the best way to give back is to, you know, take some of the money out of my pocket that I know someone else deserves more than I do and try to give that back to these people out there who are fighting cancer. He came up and, and said, like, specifically that he didn't want to do something as little as, like, just changing the shoelace to, like, a pink color. He said right from the start, like, I want it to be a little bit more impactful uh, to where I could feel good about it in the long run that I did my best to, like, help someone. When the libero brought this idea to Maniscalco, 
it quickly gained traction within their community. It started off as an idea. It started off by him the next day making a fundraising page on the American Cancer Society. Uh, the next day after that, they had donations rolling in. Uh, the next day after that, I feel like we had coaches just reaching out saying, hey, that's an awesome idea. I'd love to support. Seven local coaches have agreed to match the dollar per dig donation. Farley currently has 262 digs on the season and has raised an additional $2,396 through the fundraiser. Regardless of how many digs he records in the IHSA playoffs, Frawley will walk away fulfilled, having honored one of his deepest principles. Being able to give back is kind of one of my top priorities. It's one of my biggest morals. I always know that there's someone out there who needs something more than I do. And on his momentous senior night, the team finished it off with a walk-off ace. In Niles for Chicago This Week, I'm Caleb Nixon. We wrap things up tonight with a local neighborhood taking back their streets. A North Lawndale community group is using physical fitness as a way to keep kids away from neighborhood violence. The only thing you need to participate? A bicycle. Taylor Anthony is downtown with more. Taylor, tell us about it. Yes, Nicole, officials say there's been an alarming increase of youth violence throughout the city. However, a West Side organization has been fighting to combat this epidemic. Take a look at how the community came together to bike out negativity. Hundreds of people are coming together in support of their West Side community to bike out negativity. Children are hopping on bikes using this annual event as an outlet to stay away from violence. This event is about love. It's about, you know, honoring their community, the history, the rich history that's here in North Lawndale, and letting young people be the voices in the front and center of this bike ride. This event is hosted by the nonprofit organization Boxing Out Negativity, a boxing program designed to create a safe space for Lawndale youths. They help me conquer my goals, keep me out the streets, help the community, help the homeless, and keep me out of trouble. Founder Derek Brown faced many of the hardships growing up on Chicago's west side. But after turning his life around, he started the program to give guidance to the next generation of youth. Yeah, it helped me out get off the streets and stuff. It helped me. Help me, like, you know, like, get out of a dangerous environment and box and, like, you know, be greater in life. They say boxing out negativity is not just a program. This is a way of life. Um, this is a family. They, they'll really make you feel like family. But again, you know, you can't have a family, a healthy family, without a community. The family dynamic of this organization has increased community building efforts through events like this Unity Ride, which brought together North and South Lawndale as one. Since I've been in the role, it's been more about building community. This is a time for all of us to come together in one spot and be one. The next event will be the annual Street Love Ride in August. From Lawndale, Taylor Anthony, Chicago This Week. Thanks, Taylor, and thank you so much for watching. For more local news and sports, tune in again next week. We'll see you then. Good night, everybody. Western win that game.